We're going to take an in-depth look at PFSense version 2.4. It's going to be the latest version as of November 2017. Now, the first few things are going to be some slides from a slideshow here, but don't worry, the rest of it goes on to a live demo where I walk you through all the features of PFSense. So why PFSense? Built on a very solid BSD platform, which is great, has a lot of enterprise networking features. Open source code can be audited, and that is very important and becoming more and more critical every day to make sure that the firewalls and devices that we have to protect our networks and router networks do not have some type of hidden back doors in them. And we've actually seen lots of firewall companies for convenience, not necessarily nefarious reasons, add back doors to their system to make it easy to admin, such as hard-coded admin passwords. Horrible idea. Very configurable and customizable. Can be completely managed via well-designed web interface. Has full command line access, nothing hidden. Enterprise features such as VPN, CARP, and QoS. The failover in this is really cool. You can actually bridge firewalls together and create failover modes uh, for your real enterprise level support. Uh, Third-party plugins. They have a whole database of third-party plugins that are maintained by the PFSense folks. Commercial support available, you can get a gold subscription, which adds uh, some better support options and you get their cool newsletter. And then of course you can actually buy support packages from NetGate directly, which is the people behind PFSense. PFSense install. The requirements are fairly minimal, so it does not take a whole lot of horsepower to run this. So you're looking at a 500 uh, megahertz, 512 RAM, one gigahertz recommended, one gig RAM. Uh, CD-ROM or USB for installation. Now, they recommend less than four-year-old Intel AMD clocked at 500 megahertz. I think this is uh, probably a little older because uh, 500 hasn't been around for a, a lot more than four years, uh, but this is what's still on their page. But it can show that you don't need a ton of horsepower to do the routing on this. A two gigahertz older AMD will you know, route up to 500 megs a second, which is faster than most home connections. If you're running this at a business with gigabit fiber, then you may want to look at something a lot faster, like an enterprise hardware with PCIe. When you go to download from their website, they have the options of the AMD 64-bit, and they've deprecated the 32-bit. Uh, version 241 is the actual latest version right now, so that's the subversion is dot one. Uh, you can get the daily snapshots as well. When you're downloading this, you get a USB mem stick or CD ISO of your choice. I thought that was kind of cool that they have them on there. It's kind of strange because when you download it, you download one or the other. Uh, there's not much difference in them, but I guess BSD is a little different than Linux when you're pushing it to a thumbstick versus an ISO. Then you're brought up to the menu when you first click the install. And then from here, we're going to go ahead and jump into the live demo. So after it boots, this is the first thing you see. You get to accept the code and copyright distribution notice. You can do a rescue, an install, or recover. All your data for PFSense is stored in a config.xml file when it's loaded. So that's the only thing you have to recover. If a PFSense box somehow becomes unbootable or crashed, but you can access the drive, all you need is a config.xml file to restore it. And this does have an option to work to recover it. We're just going to run through an install. Uh, I'm not going to change the key map, but you have a bunch of different key map options in here. Now, this is really cool because you have the AutoFS, UFS, that's a standard version that they've been using forever. Then you have AutoZFS, and this is where it's a really neat feature they added in the 2.4 series. So we can choose, and this is really kind of neat, we're going to go and do a RAID Z1 because I've actually added three hard drives here. You can create RAID arrays, not just mirrored, but actual Z-level RAID arrays with ZFS for redundancy on your system. Uh, that's pretty novel. That makes it pretty cool for doing things like really solid installs that you're worried about a hard drive failing instead of just a mirror, you, you can do this. It's, it's probably overkill, um, You can, but the fact that you can do it is pretty cool. You can customize names, partition sizes, swap sizes. Uh, mirror, encrypt the swap. You can encrypt the disk, but I warn you, this is going to come with the consequence of going through and having to deal with every time you boot it up, having to put the password in. So it's really not that convenient when you do that. So we'll go ahead and uh, select this. Oh. When you're done, I'm sorry, I had to go back up to the top here and hit boom. Are you sure you want to destroy these? Yes. And away it goes. It's going to install. And install goes really fast. I'll fast forward through this and we'll jump to the web interface uh, once we're done. 
Well, this takes you through the installer, and then I'll show you that uh, what, once it boots up so we can look at the console interface, and then once we look at the console interface, we can jump into the web interface. So this is the console from a fresh install. By default, the WAN gets the first, whatever the lowest number is. These are uh, virtual network cards, so it's EM0, and the LAN gets the next one, and the rest of them are unassigned. So even if you have multiple network cards, four or six network cards in here, it only assigns the first two, WAN and LAN. Now from here, you can assign the interfaces, change them around. The default WAN interface is going to be DHCP, and the default LAN interface is always 192.168.11. All this is going to be changeable when we run the web wizard. You can even start changing it from here if you want. But these are the basic options. Now from this shell, and I'm not going to really return here, but from here, basic functions are all available for assigning interface, sending an interface IP addresses, so you can start matching your network settings. Uh, assign the interface is cool because you also get the option to build VLANs, and I have three network virtual network adapters attached to this. Uh, two of them are attached, one of them is not attached, so it tells you the link state of up, up, and down because don't have any what any virtual network cables plugged into it. Uh, you can set up your VLANs here and assign them to the interfaces if that's something. Then you enter the ones or just hit A for auto detection, but we're just going to go ahead and enter and cancel out of this. You can reboot the system, factory reset the system, halt the system, ping a host, make sure something can be gotten to so you can just, you know, drop to the shell real quick. Run PF top with option 9, it shows you the network connections and statuses on there. Q brings you out of that. Uh, update from the console, PFs, uh, P shell, and PF sense tools, which is kind of neat. So it's got some tool options on here. So change password and things like that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and exit. Restore recent configuration is really important. Uh, if you have goof things up, but you can get to the console, you can go here and uh, just run a restore. And you can say list all the backup options and actually choose different previous backup options. When we get to the backup through the web interface, you can see by default there's 30 different backup revisions that are kept and easy enough to restore. And whenever you do the restore, it just uh, applies it and restarts the system real quick. And the last thing you can do is enable secure shell from here or just drop to a shell or if you ssh in this is the same interface you get when you ssh in now all this can be locked out so if you want there's an option in here to lock yourself out of this or lock people out of this that way if they come up to a console they can't just jump on here and do things but i i don't usually do this because on the off chance one if someone goofs up a password you want to be able to reset it fairly easily two if they have physical access they can just take the firewall and you know pull the config file so if they have access it's kind of up to you it depends on how secure your environment is whether or not you want to lock this interface out all right so let's jump into the web configurator so the default login is admin and pf sense it does force you to change that in a couple clicks here And now we're into the wizard, which is pretty straightforward. NetGate Global Support is available. They'll let you know that right off the rip, which is nice. They don't annoy you, though, and that actually makes me really happy. They don't, like, prompt you, you should buy support, you should buy support. You can. This is completely optional. Uh, we're going to throw in some DNS servers. Now, these can be overridden and added later. I just want to put some in now. Or it will pull them just from PEF Sense's uh, DHCP settings. As we left the LAN here at DHCP, we're going to go ahead and choose Detroit as our uh, local. Now, when you're setting this up, this is where you can set up DHCP or static. If you're doing static and you have a block of IPs, just so you know, you only assign the first IP here, and later you add the rest of them as IP aliases to this configuration. So we're going to leave it at DHCP. It does support uh, PPTP, POE uh, configurations of and uh, I am going to uncheck this. Normally you don't have to, but block Bogon networks, you know, block private network RFC 1918s. I'm not doing that because we're running this internally and uh, it will cause some issues because it won't be able to uh, route networks because it says, hey, wait, your WAN is actually a, a LAN address. Yeah, I know. So go ahead and do this. 192.168.11 subnet 24. We're going to leave it at default here, but of course put in whatever works for you. Admin password. Set the admin password. Uh, it does not check if you typed in a weak password or not. Um, please use a good password, though, for your firewall. 
and done. And, that's, and it says if you want to learn about support or just click here to continue. Accept, and all I did was accept the uh, license agreement in here. So now we can get started on walking you through all the features of the firewall. All right, so once you complete the wizard, you're in here with the dashboard. And you can customize the dashboard. You have the NetGate support. And once again, asking if you uh, want to register and the links here, easy enough to get rid of. Just close that if you're not interested. And let's customize this a little bit. I like to have the traffic graphs on here. We'll go ahead and throw in a uh, smart status. Interface stats. The gateways. Service stats. And we'll go ahead and throw OPM VPN on here too. Now it's got a lot you can scroll down on here so you can see everything. The services, I'm going to move them up because I generally like those right here at the top. So you get an idea and it's easy enough from here just to you know restart, stop a service. Uh, and once you rearrange something on here, so when we do a move like this, the save icon, bring this back up to the top, shows up up here and we click save to save the positions of everything that we just moved around. On this side, you have the system ID. Now, this is the ID you use if you do get support by the NetGate device ID. Uh, it's a unique identifier that was generated to identify this particular system. This tells you some other information, CPU type. Uh, you can force it to check if there's a new version here. Hardware crypto that it's supported in here tells you yes, whether or not it's turned on. Now, this is an issue. It's going to come up with version 2.5 because they said that for version 2.5, no release date set for it, but they're gonna require the AES support and the chips. This chip's an older one and still has it. It's been around for a while. It's not hard to find a system uh, that has AES support in it, but just keep that in mind if you're building something new today. And they're not that expensive to find those older processors. So then we have our smart status. Now this is on a virtual machine, so we don't have uh, actual smart status. What I'm gonna do is jump over to my real machine and uh, show you kind of what that looks like for a couple of parts of this video. So it's not that important, obviously it just says whether or not there's a problem, and there. The uh, gateways, this is kind of cool. The gateways will tell you the ping time between the first hop, uh, and if you have multiple gateways for things like failover, it will tell you the ping time on each of the gateways and determine if there's a problem. Uh, unknown when there's nothing uh, hooked up, for example, we're not using DHCP6, but by default, a DHCP6 or IPv6 is turned on. So uh, it doesn't have anything to ping right now because nothing in my network is handing that out, but it'll give you the status of it. And it turns red or yellow when there's a little bit of packet loss and red when there's complete loss or a drop of a gateway on here for the monitoring. Also, we have a little uh, wrench icon and we can just say, I don't want to show this on here. Save. And we've now removed that from the gateway. Now, the reason it gave me the leave page is because I moved something and didn't hit save. And if you do that, you'll get the leave page when you're uh, editing one of the options. Now, common through the interface in here, and let me just pull it up over here, for example, in the services. Any of the services, you're going to have these related status, uh, related log entries. You're going to see that for all the different services and servers on here. So related status, related status. What these do, these bring you to the different options. For example, you can go and jump right into if there's log entries for it. By going from that service to that, you go right to the log entries for that particular service. And this works across the firewall, works across um, a lot of different parts. So here's our current firewall rules. We can see the status of the firewall rules or we can jump right to the logs that are in the firewall rules. So you'll see that those are common across all of them. They're all also accessible here under all the status page. So I can get to a lot of those same statistic things inside of here. For example, my interface, here is the interfaces and here's the settings for the interface. So there's the status of the interface and settings. Just like I said, this is common throughout all of PFSense. And on a couple different options, like in the logs and on the dashboard here, you get the little wrench, which means you can customize that particular view. Just want to make sure you're clear on that's the common way all of this is laid out. So let's start from the top. System menu, advanced. 
So protocol by default is HTTPS and it writes and designs its own SSL certificate. You and I have actually added uh, another cert here, which we'll, when we cover that in the CA part, uh, you can add your own cert. There is options. Uh, it's a more advanced and I haven't really played much with it, but I know they added features for supporting Let's Encrypt in case you're wondering. If you leave this blank, the default TCP port is 443 still. Max processes, I've never really had an issue here, but you can, If I guess if a lot of people are using a firewall, multiple people using it, multiple logins, you can set up more processes to handle that. Everything else here, I leave at default. Now, disable DNS rebinding checks, just so you know. If you have a alias like firewall.yourdomain.com and that equates to your firewall for remote access, you have to add the alternate host names in here. If not, by default, it only wants to use IP. So it sees something coming in from a domain referrer, it will fail to log in. It'll say DNS rebind attack. You can disable that or add the aliases that you're going to add here so it understands what ATTP refer is when it comes in. Just a side note there. And this is where you can disable all that. Enable secure shell. Sure, let's go ahead and turn it on. Uh, it gives you the option to disable password authentication, and there is an option to drop your keys right in the user, so you don't have to enable it, push your keys over. You can actually drop them in into the user interface. Let's go. Serial terminal. Enable first serial port. Now, this is kind of cool because um, for a lot of systems, they offer serial interfaces. Uh, it's an older school interface, but it does uh, it is supported here, and you can set it to be the primary console if you want. Uh, this is also where you password protect the console menu if you want to. Go ahead and save. And it's going to take a second because I disabled the SSH. Now, just so you know, by default, SSH is only accessible internally uh, on the LAN side, not the WAN side. So it doesn't you know, open you up uh, to any security risk or anything like that other than from internally being able to access it. Firewall and add options, you can leave all these at default, but it does have algorithmic options for higher latency, more aggressive, more conservative, and you can read about what some of those different options do, but it's basically how it handles all the state tables and how long before it lets them expire or keeps them going. You can disable all packet filtering to firewall scrub. You can really get in a lot of details here, set maximum state tables, uh, maximum fragmented, static route filtering to bypass firewall rules for traffic on the same interface. I've only had to do this one time with a client with an unusual setup, but basically if you segment your network, but they're all on one interface, but then you have series of routes that push it to different sections of that network, you because it doesn't technically pass through PFSense, it's just routing, but they're all on one interface, not split across them. That is something you may need to turn on if you have a weird network like that. For most default networks, or when you have PFSense at the middle of your network, no need to change any of these options. Um, if you make aliases, it has Verify HTTPS for some of the aliased URLs. Uh, like I said, there's some more unique things, uh, in, but completely options you can change. Now, NAT reflection, this is important one here. So NAT, network address tradition, network reflection, we're gonna change it to pure NAT. What this means for every rule I create, I want that same rule to automatically be mirrored internally. So let's say I point to a camera server, which is popular. You have your NVR, you have your external access, but then when you're inside the network, you wanna be able to get to it. What pure NAT does, if you set this as default option, is this can be changed on a per rule basis, this allows it to create the rule externally, and then when they try to access that external one, it realizes you're inside the network and creates an automatic redirect, and that can be turned on and off on a per rule basis. That's just set, all we're setting up here is the default. Uh, state timeouts, if you want to adjust the timings for the state timeouts for different parts, you can fine tune all that. I never had a need to adjust it, but it's there. Networking, allow IPv6 traffic. Uh, we can turn this off if you don't want any IPv6. You know, if you're not using it, I'm, yeah, it's there. IPv6 is neat. It's fully supported in the firewall, but um, obviously, as you know, it's not really taken off quite like everyone thought it would. Hardware checksum offloading. Now, I really recommend you build these yourself. Use the Intel network cards. Disable hardware checksum offload is for uh, when it, 
the network card handles the offloading, you want to make sure the network card can handle the offloading with the driver. And it does comment on some of the Realtek cards have a problem with this. I generally always build these with Intel cards. You can find them used on eBay for really inexpensive, including like the four port ones. Build them with the Intel cards. You don't have to worry about it. It works with a lot of different network cards, but the Intel ones in particular, I know I never had an issue with. I've never even had a problem with the Realtek ones, but just so you know, that's here. Miscellaneous. Uh, you can run this through a proxy if that's something you have a, you know, maybe your provider forces you onto a proxy, not really an issue I've run into. Uh, load balancing, enable default gateway switching. Now, I've had this where I've had to turn this on. I don't know if they fixed this, but you're supposed to just when you're setting up a load balancing, which we'll get to that on the interface side, um, be able to automatically switch. I've had it in the earlier versions where I had to enable this, but uh, for the most part, you should be able to leave this unchecked unless you have some special scenario. What it is, if one gateway goes down, it's supposed to roll over to the other one, but there's a way you set that up separately in load balancing. Power saving options. Kind of neat that it has it. I uh, don't really imagine I, that there's a lot of times people are running a PF sense on battery, but if you are, uh, it's got options for AC, battery, and unknown. Crypto Dev. Now, if you have an AESCI, uh, AESNI supported acceleration in your processor, go ahead and turn this on. I usually turn on this and the BSD crypto device. Uh, just if the long as they're enabled, you can turn them on. If you have thermal sensors, you can turn them on here. It supports Intel and AMD thermal sensors. Do not kill connection states when schedule expires. This is actually kind of interesting because you can schedule the firewall rules and you can say, even though I scheduled the firewall to, to block or allow something, you then can also say whether or not the connections that occurred while it was in operation, whether or not you want to force them to expire or do not kill them. So kind of neat that they give you the option on there. Uh, flush all states when a gateway goes down. Uh, you may want to use this on the gateway monitoring because what happens is if the gateway goes down and there's some states there, you want to make sure that they're all cleared if you're, if you're doing failover so it jumps over to the other gateway and there's nothing hanging on there. Uh, I've checked it. It seems to help uh, with the switch over. Uh, instead of using slash temp and slash var, you can force them to use me uh, memory file system. So if you had something or you didn't want a lot of read writes going to the hard drive, like you installed this from a USB stick to a USB stick, uh, that's an option on there. Save. Now, I'm not going to get too detailed in here, but we have all these system tunables. Uh, you can customize a lot of functions and add your own parameters. I don't have a guide to all the ones in here, but uh, kind of neat. Here's all the defaults. If there's some reason to update those, you can. Notifications, email server, SMTP port numbers. Yes, it supports SMT, SSL, TLS. From email address, notification email address. This is great. Um, first, one little note though, when you're putting all in here, you can't test the functions until you've clicked save once. So even if you fill out all your mail server information here, then you click test, it fails. You have to go down here, click save, then you can click test, and then you'll know if the SMTP is working. But this allows notifications and changes to the firewall to be sent to your email address, such as gateway monitoring if you have failover, and it goes down, or a problem with the hard drive, or some other alert in here. We have the alerts up here at the top for the notices, uh, and what this, so you how they work is little bell icon, SSH key gen, SSH startup. It let me know that it generated a new key for that. I marked as red and now the bell went away. So that's it for all the notifications, everything on here. Next one down is cert manager. Here is the uh, demo VPN cert VA, and we're going to walk through the details of this when I get to the VPN of how this was created, but you can add your own CAs, you can import them. Uh, create new ones, and these are for like doing your self science certificates for whatever reason you want to do them for. Uh, and the demo part is, of course, for the VPN. Here's the web configurator default. This one's generated on load, and this is the LTS cert. So, uh, Lawrence Technology Services cert I did for the demo VPN. And there's a certificate revocation built in here. General setup. 
This is where you name the firewall and the domain, add the DNS servers. Now, kind of novel, you can attach, if you have multiple gateways, you can attach a DNS server to a gateway. So whenever the query goes in, it goes out over that gateway, uh, kind of novel. And probably if the DNS servers are local only to that provider, you might even need that. And you can add more of them just by going here and add as many DNS servers as you want. And this is where you can go and change your time zone, time servers, uh, language options, which there's a handful of languages in here. This is kind of neat too. And I'll switch it once just so you can see. Hit save. And we've now changed the theme of PFSense. So uh, I usually leave it at default, kind of novel. It's got a couple different options on there. So we're going to put it back at default over here. You have to refresh the page each time when it does, even though it saves. And away we go. You can change all the themes and the colors. Uh, you can decide when not the top scrolls with the page or remains visible at the top of the page. I kind of like when it remains visible. That way, if I'm down here, I'm going to save it. And now the PF Sense menu stay at the top. I, I don't know, I kind of like that better, but obviously it's uh, options you can change. Uh, dashboard columns, sort alphabetically, you can turn on or off more associated panels. Display whether or not a state table without a filter. These are all li more little customizations to the UI that you can make, including do you like blue, green, red, purple, gray, orange uh, for the login screen? Uh, show host name on login banner. Like I said, more customization stuff. I. It's novel that they have this for a firewall that you can play with all those things. Now, PF sync transfer state insertion, update, and deletion message between firewalls. This is a way that you can have high availability sync, so for redundant and failover firewalls, and create your peer IPs and one system. So you only have to edit one firewall, and then the connections will sync between them. It's not something I've really set up, but if you have an enterprise environment and you want to have redundancy in your firewalls, this is how you would do that. It has all the different syncing options, and it's granular. So you can say, you know, toggle all. I want all the rules, aliases, everything about the firewall to sync, or only parts of it to sync, because maybe you want the firewalls to be different from each other and only sync certain changes that you make. Here is where the logout is. That just logs us out. Package manager. The package manager is pretty slick. And the OpenVPN client is one of the packages I loaded. Here's a big list of available packages. And we're going to load them real quick because I like IF top in here. I'm going to search for it. There it is where I could have just scrolled. You run through, click the install, confirm. And it runs through and installs the package for you. It also automatically installs any dependencies that that package may have had and got them all. It does this all through the PFSense repositories. Go back to install packages, and now we have that package installed. If you want to remove a package, click that, it removes it. Really straightforward. Uh, this is view, inf view more information about the package, and this also is an update. So what it does is it turns yellow here when there's an update available, and the icon uh, looks a little different. This will reinstall a package as well. So if you've played with the package, you've goofed it up, you can actually just do this and it'll confirm that you want to reinstall that particular package. Now, the packages do updates and things like that automatically will update themselves as well um, when you're doing a system update. But if there's a package update in between system updates, you can go here and manually do it. I don't think there's any notification you get when a package is out of date, though. Not that I've seen. Routing. So your gateways are located here. Your gateway groups are created here in your static route. So if you have a static route that you want to add, you can pick which interface you want to add it to. And this is where you can do your static routing options. Gateways, this is where you're going to add a gateway. So you can put this in, put the gateway name in, whether or not it's going to be the uh, default gateway. By default, everything gets monitored as a gateway, uh, but you can override that and disable it. You can force the state of it and uh, everything. There's a non-parse description, so you can give a friendly naming for it. You can also simply take and duplicate a current gateway. So you meant if the way your network's set up and it's uh, they're very similar, you just want to duplicate the same settings, you can do that. Now, the gateway groups, this is kind of clever. Um, you create a group, and this is what you would do for failover. So we only have one gateway on here, one WAN system. So, but if we wanted to, 
uh, create a failover group. We're going to name it failover. You would have each of the gateways in here, and you set their tiers of priority. So you tier one, tier two, tier three, and that's the order by which they will be used. You can say this is the main gateway, but this is my failover one would be the tier two one, the third failover, tier three, so on and so forth. Also, if you were using this in like a round robin for kind of more load balanced setup, you would set them to be the same tier. You set each one of the gateways. Like I said, there's only one showing up here, but you set each one of them to be the same tier, and that would allow a load balanced type so you can have uh, some of the data going between both networks. Now, you can also say what is the determining factor of switching between it from tier one to the next tier down. Member down, packet loss, high latency or a combination of packet loss and high latency. These can be fine-tuned back in some of the editing, uh, where you can say just how much high latency is high latency. But what this does is allows you to determine when it should go to the other one. If they're both at the same tier, you can also say high latency should just start pushing them over to the other one too. So that's an option on there. And you can create multiple WAN failover groups when you're doing these. So you don't have to just have one, you can create multiple them. So if you have a really crazy enterprise network, that's actually something that's supported in here. Setup wizard, you can just run this again. That's the setup wizard. Update, it's up to date. Update settings, uh, if you want to change to be a release candidate um, or any of the other uh, latest development snapshots, that's an option in here. The updates to say an update available, you say yes and away they go. I think they fixed it, but I know in 2.4, the only bug I seen with the update was sometimes you had to hit it twice. It would say update failed, you say do it again and it would pass. It just wouldn't download the first time. But so far since switching to 241, that's a problem I believe that was fixed. So in case you've seen that problem, uh, just clicking it twice fixed it. And that was in, the, I believe, the notes of the 241 update that that was a problem solved. All right, the user manager. So you can obviously, it has its own local database, the user manager. It does support adding uh, either LDAP or radius servers for external authentication. You can set a couple things like which authentication server, auto refresh time, session timeout. You can build groups, which by default there's all and admins. And then right here is one particular user. Let's just walk you through adding a user. So we're going to put Tom in here. Uh, you can expire users. Leave it blank if you don't want them to expire. Use individual customized GUI options and a dashboard layout for this user. So it allows you like individual customizations, uh, like you can set their theme and a couple other things in there, kind of novel. What, what membership they have, authorize SSH keys and IPsec pre-shared key. Don't save. Now, when we go back and edit this user, then we can fine grain go through all the permission options. And this is pretty slick because you can, if you have a user that's only a able to do certain things because you say, I only want them to admin one thing, you can set that up so they only have to admin those things in there. Now, because of the way this is just a local user da database, you can give the person no permissions and they would still be able to access the VPN, for example. It doesn't allow them to log into the web interface, but it can just be used for basic authentication for the VPN side of things. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, clear this and go back. Uh, this is where you add individual certificates. If you wanted each user to have their own certificate for the VPN, you could add each import and existing, create, create a signing request, all the standard certificate options for that particular user could be assigned. And of course, like I said, the SSH keys. You can also disable the user. This user cannot log in. This is often what I do with admins. Uh, once I create the new user, I'll create a secondary admin user, and we always disable the admin on admin login. But when you disable the admin login in PF Sense, that also disables the root login via SSH, just an FYI. So if you're SSHing in, you can SSH in as the individual users, but you can't SSH as root anymore because root privilege was reserved for the admin user. So once you disable that, you disable root. Also, root's password is whatever the same password for the admin user, but ideally you should be using keyed authentication so the password doesn't become very relevant at that point. So that's it for the user manager, pretty straightforward. Uh, it does have the option to create a special group, special, uh, we'll just call them the firewall group. If I could type, firewall group. 
definition, save, then we can go back and edit and add the fine grain permissions and let's say we just want to go with everything that's uh, firewall related. Now also, if you notice, there's two rules in each of these. One's a rule, one's an edit. So you can actually have them just view versus that. Maybe you want to create a user read only. If you got that new guy, you want him to be able to look at the firewall and understand it, but not actually make the changes without supervision. Uh, so that's definitely some of the options you may want to choose. Uh, but it, it gives you a nice fine grain control here and type in fire. And this will narrow down everything firewall related. And we'll just do this, select save here's all the firewall permissions for this particular group save and then we can go back to the user edit the user member of firewall save now tom's part of the firewall group really it's pretty straightforward user management but i do like that it has it because this relates back to you'll see further in our firewall part where which user did what, it does track uh, what, where they were logged in from and which user made what changes to things like some firewall rules that's all logged in the change logs. Interfaces, assignments. So the interface system allows a lot of different options here. So this is an assigned interface, that's why it's deletable. Here's an unassigned interface. Actually, there's two of them in here so we can choose which one we want and we'll get into that in a second. So interface groups, you can group interfaces together and that allows you to apply firewall rules to groups of interfaces, which is kind of nice. So if I did this and then I selected two interfaces and give it a name, I can apply rules and functions to that. Now, what's kind of cool is you can apply this as a group to these or you can provide them individually in the firewall. They all show up together like that. So let's actually go over here and give you a little better idea. So we're gonna add this other network interface save it and now it's called opt1 we're going to enable it i'm going to add an ip address to it so ipv4 save apply and now we have this other interface. Now I can rename the descriptors on any of the interfaces here so it's opt1 wan lan all of these are editable Ed editable, not edible. <laughs> so we can edit all these. Now let's jump back to our assignments, interface groups, and there it is here. And these are our lands. Let's call them that. Save. And now they show up as lands right here. So I can apply the rules to them. So that's what the grouping's for, which is really slick that you can do these interface groups. And you can delete them just as easy. So we're going to go ahead and remove it. And away we go. Now, wireless. I'm going to uh, have to skip some of this right now. But you have full wireless support. I just don't have a wireless interface plugged into this. But it does have full wireless support and setting it up. So you can actually plug in a supported wireless card. I don't have the active list, but you can find them in a BSD list. If it's a supported wireless card in BSD, you get all the features of the Wi-Fi, you know, setting up as an access point, uh, setting up the password, WPA, WPA2, and a lot of the options in there. Kind of neat. Um, if you want to use this at home as a wireless device, definitely possible. VLANs. VLANs are kind of interesting the way they're handled in here because they also add an interface. So you offer them on any of the any of the interfaces can have another VLAN. So we're going to have a VLAN attached to our LAN. VLAN 22. Test VLAN 22. Save. Now we've added a VLAN. You're kind of wondering where did it go? Let's go back over here to interface assignments. VLAN 22. We have to add it again over here. Save. It called it opt2, but we actually are going to call it opt VLAN. So it has a name. No spaces in here. Let's give it a configuration. I gave the other one 22, so we'll give this one 222.1. Actually, we'll do go 111.1. Um, and uh, it's going to be a slash 24, so hit save, enable, apply. Whoop, forgot to click save. 
Now we're applying. So now it's called Opfield Analytics. So these can be renamed at any time. And now let's look over to Firewall. There's WAN, LAN, Opt1, Opt VLAN in the firewall rules and in the interfaces here. Now, in case you're wondering, the difference between a WAN and LAN interface. So if you wanted to make multiple WAN interfaces, WAN interfaces have a gateway, LAN interfaces do not. So for over here on a LAN interface, add gateway option is here. Once we add a gateway to this, it's technically a WAN interface. So that's some of the differences, and that's how PFSense identifies them, not at all by name. You call them whatever you want. The default is WAN and LAN and OPT and so on and so forth, but of course you can rename them. And what we do for some of our clients to make it less confusing is we'll call the WAN interface with redundant connections, maybe Comcast, and the secondary WAN interface, AT&T, if that's their backup. And having it assigned that way makes it very clear, this is the Comcast line, this is the AT&T line, and we understand which one's which when we're assigning them. I usually leave the name WAN in there, so I'll say like Comcast WAN and AT&T WAN, but it's just a clarification and no big deal. So back over here to the assignments. So we created the VLAN, we assign it, and you can see it's attached to that network. And it also everywhere else shows up, so it's something else we can create an interface group for. Okay, back to the interface assignments. Link aggregation is supported. So you can take and use the uh, link aggregation protocol to uh, link together interfaces. Bridging is supported. Gift tunnels and GRE tunnels and PPP uh, are supported. So you can uh, do some tie-in for the PPP configuration. Now I'm not real familiar with it, but I know it's an older uh, serial interface, I believe, for PPP. It's not something I'm overly familiar with. So, but it has a couple different link types in there for PPP, PPOE, PPTP, and LTP. So uh, kind of crazy configuration option there. Not, I don't have much use case for a lot of these. I'm not overly familiar with the GRE and GIF tunnels, but just let you know they are supported in here. Now let's get a little bit detailed on the bridging though, because the bridging feature in PFSense is really clever. You can bridge a couple interfaces together. And when you create this, let's go ahead and uh, test bridge. Save. Now let's go back and edit this bridge. A bridge interface causes PFSense to treat all the ports you bridge together as a switch. So it can act as essentially a standard switch. And where it gets pretty cool is you have spanning ports, you have edge ports, auto edge ports. It works like a managed switch. Auto PTP ports, sticky ports, private ports, as in you can set up isolate network isolation on them. It supports uh, spanning tree protocol options, uh, both of them RTSP and STP. You can choose the interfaces for that to make sure when those are set up and the options for it and lots of details in between here. So this is kind of novel for being able to have it, so to speak, act as a, a switch. So if you have a bunch of network interfaces, you want them just to switch together. You can do this and without even having to really assign anything to them. They'll just act in a switch mode, which kind of kind of neat that it does that. Uh, I've seen people build 10 gigabit switches with this. Uh, I don't know how effective it is for throughput, but you can get those dual and quad cards and then use PFSense to uh, tied them all together in a bridge mode. So kind of novel. And so we don't break anything, I'm gonna delete the bridge. Cause I'm sure it'll mess something up that I'm gonna test later on. So that's pretty much all the interface option assignments in here. Uh, it also supports this, which I'm not overly familiar with you, the Q and Q options as well. Not, not a feature I'm overly familiar with, but if you are, you know what this is already and you're excited that it's in here. So let's look at the interfaces themselves and what can be done. And so for our WAN interface, we're just going to turn off DHCP6. Don't need it. We have it set to DHCP here, but we can just easily statically assign IP addresses if we need to. Uh, advanced configuration on this is kind of neat. So as the DHCP client, you can force overrides on things. Uh, so you can change different presets change different uh, lease requirements, send options, receive options. They give you a lot of little customizations in here, which is kind of cool. Now, if you're doing the static, it's nice that you can add the gateway here and it brings up the, uh, the add gateway menu. So if you're statically assigning it, you just type in 
what you want assigned here, the IP address. Now, if you have multiple IP addresses like I mentioned before, you're going to want to add them secondary. You only add the first IP of a block in here and the net mask over here that uh, that's assigned for that IP, but you add all the extra IPs elsewhere, not here. And I kind of like to they leave shortcuts here to take you right over to the gateway uh, so you can add them here manually as opposed to adding them in a little pop-up window, but both work. One's just a pop-up window to keep you at that WAN gateway when you're adding it without having to go to a second menu when you can put it all in at once. Now for the LAN side, like I said, when there's no IPv4 stream gateway, it becomes a LAN address, not a WAN uh, port. So pretty straightforward. And this is just for an assignment. And once again, here's the IP address and then the net mask over here for it. So pretty straightforward on there. Uh, you can enable disable them right here and just click save at the bottom. And there's our other interfaces, so on and so forth. No big deal there. Now let's jump over to the firewall rules. Now, because I just mentioned it, I'll actually start at the bottom here, virtual IPs. So if you want to add another IP to the WAN, you would type in that address here. So 192.1, the WAN address right now is what you see up here. I know it's internal because this is for my demo. So if we had like 223, we would just click add and you can keep adding each virtual IP address with the right net mask to it. And that's how you would get all the IP addresses for your WAN. So if your WAN offers you a block of IP addresses, this is where you add them all here. Also in the virtual IP options, you can add your uh, CARP address for the failover. Uh, proxying ARP is an option. And then there's the other, and this is some of the things the other part can be used for. I'm just jumping over to the help. Uh, can be used for NAT, cannot be used by the firewall itself to run or bind services. So I guess it's a unique way if you have some unique use case where you want to NAT something but not have it necessarily uh, completely controlled by the firewall and everything else like a normal interface. So definitely an option there, which is kind of neat. So there's all the virtual IPs. Most of the time I'm just using the IP alias because uh, clients have several IP addresses assigned to them. This is a simple, you know, go to the WAN uh, that it's related to and assign the IP address. It's pretty straightforward. Aliases. Now this is a great feature in PFSense. Why would you want to alias things? Well, convenience. So we have the option for all of them to be listed here, URLs, ports, or IP. Now the URLs might not be what you're thinking. We'll get to that in a second, but let's say we want to have camera ports here and uh, NVR camera server. We're going to go ports. Now you can choose host ports, URL, IPs, network. So you only have one create, and then this is the filter by choosing what type you're creating. So you can create a series of hosts in there and an IP or a fully qualified domain. You can use networks. So here's the uh, network or fully qualified name and description. The ports, and we'll do those in a second here. URLs, now this is where it gets interesting. Enter as many URLs desired after saving the URL will be downloaded and the items imported to the alias. You can put in a URL here that downloads into the firewall. So instead of having a bunch of stuff typed, if you have them saved in a list and web available, this allows you to import those in right into here. Same with the URL for ports. You can just import groups of port numbers. Let's say you have, you know, 300, 400 ports you have to set. You can then tie them to an alias and then import them from a URL. This one is interesting as well because this is table of IPs or table of ports. Now, when you do this, this isn't a, a mask. This is actually the number of days for how often you want to pull that. So you can actually create these lists host them on a server and have it every now and then recheck that URL based on, you know, a schedule that is in here and refresh that information. So after slash is frequency update and date. So once a day, pull from this URL and pull these IPs into this list for something. So really novel that you have that level of control in here. We're just going to do ports. So let's say our NVR needs port 80 open is the HTTP. Add a port 443 for HTTPS add port. Let's say it's a 9,000 to 9,100. And what I did was just put a colon in there and we'll call these control ports. And we're going to hit save, apply. 
Now we have an alias for the camera settings. And we're gonna get to these when we get to the firewalls. But if I would have called this a URL or anything, this is so you can categorize all the different things you have in here. You can also, if you wanted to have a mail server in here and assign the IP so you can remember it. So you put the mail server there, it's a host, IP address, mail, server, and then we can have a hosted one in there, whoops. Oh, mail server is apparently a reserved keyword, didn't know that. The mail, there we go, save. And then when we're setting aliases, I can actually put this in instead of IP. So this one, there's no arrows, there's a port, and there's all, they just show up in a list here. So we're gonna go ahead and leave these two in. Uh, well, actually we'll add one more, so we'll apply changes, add. And VR recorder, and VR recorder here, it's a host. So IP address, 168.1.10. And we'll pretend this is our fake NVR server. For the camera, save, apply. All right, now when we do some firewall rules, we have some aliases to play with. So let's start over here at NAT. So you have port forwarding, one-to-one, -one if you just wanna do a whole one-to-one -one, uh, map mapping of everything. Outbound, outbound you can leave the same unless, and there's a couple uh, exceptions. When you're doing peer-to-peer -peer VPNs where you're connecting two PF SenseBox together, I have a whole separate video on that. Uh, this is where you're gonna wanna mess with this because you're gonna wanna change the way the outbound rules are. Right now, by default, the outbound says, send everything out automatically over the WAN interface. That's fine, that's what you want. But you may wanna create specific rules and these are all auto-generated. As I generated those other interfaces, it auto-generated all these rules and they're dynamic. It'll keep updating them because it's all set to automatic. And what this is allowing you to do is choose what is the outbound route for a particular piece of traffic. So you can actually turn this into manual and you could say this network goes over this WAN, this network goes over that WAN, so it gives you all the options. And when we set this to manual, all these become uh, editable and duplicatable so you can get really fine grain. You can also go over here and create your own uh, NAT mappings for how things go. These are all real advanced use cases, but it's completely there for the outbound. Options. Now this is different than outbound rules. This is outbound mapping of data as it goes out. So let's go over here to port forwarding. This is mostly what people wanna do is some basic port forwarding. So interface WAN, lots of protocol options, UDP, TCP, ICP, so on and so forth. You can even uh, port forward like GRE, IPv6, a little bit of everything in here. Even ICMP protocol can be done. We're just gonna do TCP. WAN address, if you had multiple addresses in here, you would be able to do those as well. So if you had a whole block of addresses, they would all show up in this list. Custom camera ports. Now I could type it in or I can auto-complete it. So camera ports, camera ports. And we know that where do they want these to go? The NVR. So here's the NVR recorder. I could type in the IP address here, just the same, like it shows here. I could put in the IP of the machine, just like that, or it auto-completes with uh, that. Also, it's not case sensitive, so I type in even a lowercase n, it'll auto-complete, and it's doing an alias lookup in, in here to find that. So there's the camera ports mapped to the NVR, real straightforward. NAT reflection, use system default, which is pure NAT, but this is where we can override that. This is also a default. Add associated filter rule. So we're gonna hit save and show you what that means. So source address, source ports, which means any, doesn't matter where they came from, what address or port they're coming in on, if they land, and I like the mouse over here, on port 80, 443, or 9000 through 9100, land it on the NVR recorder, and this gives me the IP address of the NVR recorder. So it's really easy now to update these rules if I move the NVR recorder, or if you're doing things like grouping them together, um, this is how it looks. Now let's duplicate the rule. And uh, we'll just put port 25, we're gonna create a mail server in here. But we'll do it all manually, just to show you the difference. 
So everything's the same in here. Save, apply, and this is what it looks like when you're doing it here. So here we have it aliased. So it shows the values and things like that. Here we're typed it in raw and it auto completed to be that. All right, so let's create a couple more mail server rules here. And one quick way to do it, I can keep hitting add and creating a new rule each time, or I can say add a new NAT rule based on this one. So I'm going to change the port. This is the only thing we're going to do different. So it goes to the same server to go 993 and change this one here. You can choose from the list in there, but uh, when you're editing them, it's obviously easier to type in custom. If you just know the port numbers, you've been doing this a long time, it's easier. But of course you could choose from, and it'll uh, put those in here. So if you can't remember what the SMTMP or SMTMPS ports are, or in this case, uh, I know that's the IMAP S port is 993. Yep, and that's IMAPS, hit save, apply, and now we have mail server IMAPS. And if we wanted to add one more, go in here, and uh, we'll actually just duplicate the rule and change this to IMAP, and change this one to IMAP, and this is the IMAP not secure, save, apply. And you can kind of see we're quickly building the rules for our uh, pretend mail server here, but as you can also see, this could get really complicated really fast. So you go here and we're gonna say, let's put a separator. And these are our mail server rules. And we're gonna make them green and hit save and drag. Then let's put another separator and these are NVR rules. We'll leave that one the default color and move it up here. This is a kind of nice thing. So the rules are all drag and drop. You can move them around, sort them by order. This applies to the firewall rules as well. So you can actually reorder a firewall rule by drag and dropping it. So then we're gonna go ahead and hit save. And that just saves all the positions in the rules. So if you rearrange them, you do have to click the save button. You notice how it's kind of grayed out. And once we've rearranged stuff, you got the it becomes not gray, so you can click the save button. We can't. It's not clickable right now. But yeah, putting separators in, and uh, then we can say like, you know, web server rules, make those red, save. And from there, we'll add an, whoops, sorry, I forgot to click save, stamp page, save. Now I can go add again, and let's do port 80, 80, And we'll just call this uh, HTTP server, save, apply. It put it at the top. I want it underneath here for making it look pretty. And you can see we've quickly built all these port forwarding rules from the WAN address to an internal address here. Now, if you want to disable a rule, you can just click that, hit apply the rule just comes grayed out. That means disabled. So you just check the box, apply. Really easy if you want to quickly leave a rule there, but disable it for now. Now, another question that comes up a lot is access to that rule. And this is where your sources come in and you can say a single network and you can say, let's, well, we'll do a single IP address single host for alias. So for example, if you only want a specific IP address to be able to access this, you can put in that IP address in here. And then only this IP address, and we'll go ahead and save here. So source address has to be this in order to see that. Though it's a common option. We actually, when we set firewalls up, a lot of times it, when we're doing remote work, we quickly throw in only our IP address so where it can easily get to the web interface, but don't want anything else to be able to access it. So that's a pretty simple way to do that and uh, filter it so it only does there. And you can even create an alias list for the addresses so you can keep like a list of addresses that are allowed to access that. It's it's a nice way if you if you have a predefined, you need something open to the web, but you have a predefined list of IP addresses, this gives you a really easy way to do that. And we'll change it back to any, save, apply, back to normal, you know, asterisk as in wildcard all. But 
Now, there's two pieces to the firewall. This is the NAT side, and now we got to talk about the firewall rules side. And when you were doing these and creating the rules, let me just show you at the very bottom again, add associated filter rule. So go back over here. Whoops. Yeah, sometimes you click back, it does that. But you're not supposed to click just the back button inside here. So we're going to go to the firewall rules. You notice how the word NAT is in front of each of these? NAT mail server, NAT this, NAT HTTP server. These are the other rules we added. And the uh, mouse server still works, tells you what ports they are. And there's no traffic being passed over these right now, but it, it can actually log the traffic. So in this number of states uh, that are associated with this, so evaluations, packet zero, evaluation. So it has, you know, gives you some fine details in there. And what these are doing, and the separators and everything else, and the drag and drop, uh, you can rearrange the order of the rules here. You can also uh, disable the rule, just like you can. So we can disable it there or there. It's the same thing. But when you try to edit the rules, so here we go. And here is the associated filter rule. So when you click on a firewall rule, it can take you back to the NAT rule that created because I, obviously I can't change any of this stuff because it was created from here. But it hyperlinks right to that, which is really clever. So you can say, okay, here's the rule and here is the NAT rule associated with it. So we'll go back into the firewall rules. And if you wanna just add a brand new firewall here, firewall rule here, um, pass block reject, disable this rule, protocols, same list of protocols are in there. Actually, I think one more because I think PF sync. You can set the protocols for how that traverses the firewall. IPv4, IPv6, the interfaces. Now, another side note here. So this is just a filter to say here's the WAN ones, the LAN ones, Opt1, Opt1 VLAN, OpenVPN rules. But when you also when you're creating a firewall rule, if I go over here and create it for Opt1, so let's say we want to open up this port here, destination any, description, save. I didn't put a description there, but it now is over here. So it didn't add it under WAN, even though we click the add button under WAN because I changed the interface. And also if I go here, change, save, apply, it's no longer under here. It's now under here for port 666 being open. So really, the firewall rules, when you're looking at them, this is just a filter for the rules, but it moves based on where you apply it to. So if whichever option or interface you apply it to here was where the firewall rule will move. So a couple more advanced things on the firewall. This is really clever. So you can uh, turn on logging. So if you want to log all the uh, packets handled by this particular rule. You can have uh, inverse matching. So for any of these that you can match, you can also invert the rule. But then the advanced options is really neat. We have source OS fingerprinting. Now, obviously it's limited to as good as OS fingerprinting is and it's very spoofable, but it is kind of novel that you could actually create firewall rules that use OS fingerprinting and say only accept or pass this rule based on that if it matches this OS. So this is like fine grain. You can actually create a filter rule that creates a tag. Then you can filter a secondary rule that filters again on those tags that you created from the first rule. So this is a rule where you can tag things. This is another filter where if it matches a certain tag, uh, then apply this. So you can kind of create an entire matrix of firewall rules under the advanced of things that happen to a packet. If you have some real advanced use cases, there's absolutely a lot of details you can do. Uh, VLAN priority, VLAN priority set. Scheduling, if we create schedules, and I'll show you how the schedule works, we can actually have this rule applied to a schedule. Now you can leave everything at default and then just create the schedule rule, definitely an option. And then we have the uh, in-out pipes. This is a way to choose an out virtual interface for these. So once again, more rules that can be applied for where you wanna push the data based on certain policies. Now let's show the scheduler. So let's go to scheduler. We're going to add a schedule. And we want the firewalls to work on these days here. I hit add. And now Wednesday through Saturday, all day, is the schedule. we got to give the schedule a name. When sat, hit save. There's our Wednesday schedule. Let's go back to the firewall rules. 
Go to edit our 666 rule. Advanced. Schedule. And as you can see here, now this is a rule Wednesday through Saturday to make this firewall rule work. So it works on a schedule now. Kind of clever that they have that in here. I don't have a lot of use case for it, but if you did, if you did want to create rules that only work on certain times of day or uh, certain days of the week, that is certainly an option. It also has an option to expire the rules so they don't start working till a certain time and then end at a certain time and date. So kind of clever, but uh, definitely interesting how that happens. It also has some queue options if you want to create specific firewall rules for some of the traffic shaping, which we're going to get into next. So I'm going to go ahead and kill this rules. We don't need it. Apply. And if you want to know the status of any of the rules, this is the related settings, related status, which tells you the fil what the filter is doing. This is like the quick uh, on-screen display every time the filter gets reloaded. And you can jump right to the log and see any of the filters for this, including the logging of this filter, dynamic view, summary view. Um, and then if you want to advance things like this, we'll go ahead and filter it real quick. So let's just filter it for uh, source IP. And you can filter it just for a single IP address, just like that, and follow it through there and what the action taken was. Then this is a quickly add a rule to pass that or add it to a block list. You can just mouse over these and create your passes and blocks real quickly. But you can see how quickly this is easy to jump from the firewall to the rule to filtering something very directly. And this supports uh, regular expressions to do the filtering. So let's go back over to our firewall rules. And just under the firewall rules is traffic shaping. Now, it's got options individually that I don't know how to use uh, where you create all these, but obviously that's tedious and creating bandwidth and queue size limits and some of the details, that's difficult. We're gonna jump right to the wizard, which makes it really, really easy. So the traffic shaping wizard, run this. How many WAN interfaces? One, we have a, let's say we're gonna pretend we have a 10 megabit connection up and then the download is 50. Next. Actually, I think I chose the wrong one. One, local interfaces, LAN, I missed that. So 10, 10, uh, I'm sorry, 50. Next, prioritize VoIP traffic. You've got a couple built in, uh, generic load delay. And if you know your SIP server, you can put that in there. And let's say we want a uh, reserve one megabit for the parameters. So this is gonna keep one, that much open based on our traffic. Uh, you can have a penalty box, so you can set a lower priority for a specific IP address. Lower priority peer-to-peer -peer traffic. And this supports things like uh, Aimster, BitTorrent, BuddyShare, lots of different ones in here. I don't know how many of them besides BitTorrent are as relevant anymore. Has Napster still in there? I don't know how much Napster traffic we're really seeing. We'll go ahead and click Next. Oh, uh, posted bandwidth, catch-all, uh, enabled all on carry traffic units. Let's just say in percentage. Don't let it go to 90. Oh. Actually, it says between 2 and 15 is the value, so we'll put it 15. So keep that much free, I believe is what it wants. Prioritize gaming traffic. Sure, let's create queues for all these to make sure my gaming traffic's uh, prioritized. It actually has a few old school ones in there. It's got Unreal Tournament, Wolfenstein, some newer ones in here too. So next, enable our networking protocols. Sure, let's say we have uh, MSRDP and VNC. We want those to be high priority protocols. It's got a bunch of other ones in here. Um, Git, DNS, why not have DNS at a higher priority? Let's have ping at a high priority. If you're passing SMB, Keep it at a high priority. Next, finish. And it just created all the rules. So back over here to Traffic Shaper. Here are all the rules. Here's the queue for the games, other, and let's uh, take a look here at related status. And what this is doing is measuring the bandwidth going through each of these queues and automatically is doing what we wanted to do from the wizard. 
That's how quick it is to set up the QoS on these. So you can build rules that prioritize your VoIP traffic and actually leave the rest blank is most frequently what we do for our clients. They just need the VoIP to work properly. This firewall has no problem doing it. I often will put whoever their SIP provider is in the SIP provider field to make sure it understands that that SIP uh, fully qualified domain is the right one. But it's that easy to set up a traffic shaping in this and tweak it. You can then go inside of here and actually tweak some of the settings uh, directly. Like I said, I'm not an expert at actually using all the different queue limits, but you don't have to be. You can always just re rerun the wizard if you need to. And if you do, didn't want the traffic shaper on anymore, remove, done. Queues are all gone. Nothing needs to be done. You're all set and you can just run the wizard again. And it does have a multiple LAN WAN option and a standard dedicated LAN WAN for the wizard for traffic shaping. So pretty straightforward to use. So let's jump over here to Captive Portal. So that's all we have on the firewall list. Captive Portal is really interesting that they put this in here. So we're going to create a test zone. Testing. Enable. And we're going to put this on the LAN. Now, what this allows you to do is, like, for when someone logs onto your network, they can go in and have an authentication web page that comes up for them. And it's got lots of detail, so you can really fine-tune this. Idle timeout, maximum concurrent connection. So this is using coffee shops, for example, where you want them to go to a splash page, agree to some terms of service, and once they agree to terms of service, they get on the Internet. But this goes a lot further than that. So here's waiting periods, logout pop-out windows, pre-authentication, after authentication redirection. Usually you want to redirect them to some type of landing page with your specials. You know, we've set this up in schools too, and it works really well there. And you can set passwords. It also has built-in default bandwidth upload limitations and download limitations. So you can use a per-user bandwidth restriction and put the restrictions in here. It has a voucher option. Radius authentication, so if you have an external radius server, it's got a couple different options there. But the local vouchers is one we're going to talk about here in a second. Create your own HTML file. Kind of clever. You download this little template and customize HTML around it. These are a couple parameters that can be passed around there for a username and password. Uh, an error page and a logout page, you can upload all those here. And once you have all those uploaded to the system, you can also push in certain files and things like that. Also, as uh, HTTPS direction. So once you load your assets and create some photos, you can actually load them into PFSense. It'll serve them up. This is our authentication page, blah, blah, blah. And away you go. So the vouchers part, that's where this gets pretty interesting. It has the ability, and these are some of the keys you can use and where we can do them three, four, five, six. And you pick a character sets to use. The default character set is everything but O, O, O and 0, 1 and L. It removes them because they're ambiguous. And it creates, you can generate the keys, generate an entire voucher set. For example, a series of numbers to hand out to people. So this voucher, and you say the voucher is valid for however many minutes or however many long you want them to log in. And then once they get disconnected, they have to put a new voucher in. It, it's really integrated well into here. So you can have the tickets, all this in here. It also supports an external database. Now, they didn't. I don't have all the details here, but I think there's some forum posts uh, how to set this up, but still really clever. If you wanted to have a ticketed based system to hand out internet, you know, in a metered way to clients that come in, or let's say a hotel where they get a voucher assigned to them based on uh, their stay, you can give them a voucher number, it expires, and now everyone has a unique trackable system so you understand who got on and when and easy to kick them off so you don't have people leeching on your system. And over here is that file manager that we were talking about where you can upload some of the assets to there, such as pictures or whatever else you want to upload for the web serving part of it. You also can do things like allowed host names or allowed IP addresses or allowed MAC addresses. You can just copy your own MAC address and permanently pass you or permanently block you. This is really clever when setting up the school networks because we just had each of the teachers logged in real quick, copy their MAC address on here, and boom, 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 their system's automatically based on their MAC address. I know it couldn't be spoofed, so I'm going to have to spoof a MAC address, but it's on a system of convenience, unless they really know the MAC address on there of what's passable. It makes it really easy to say these computers or devices get on automatically, or when you have devices like a Chromecast, for example, or other IoT devices that you want on here to bypass the voucher system, 
well, then you want them to automatically in this list. That way they can't just jump on the network and have internet access. So that's the captive portal. The system does support DHCP relay across different interfaces. I've rarely ever had to use this. I think one time I had a client, if you have it in the middle, you have a head-end DHCP server and another subnet, you can have this pass the uh, DHCP services across and have a destination where they get forwarded to. So that's DHCP relaying. I'm going to jump over here to my firewall to show you the DHCP server because we have reservations and more things set than I do on my demo server. So here's the DHCP server, uh, enable DHCP server on LAN interface. You choose one for each interface so you can turn on DHCP, LAN, WAN, and all the different ones that are set up. You can add additional pools. So if you had different areas, you, you want like a one range and then another range from there. Um, options override the default gateway, override a lot of different things. So if you had another something else you want to put in here, that is definitely an option to be able to do that. Uh, enable, enable static ARP entries. So you can actually keep, create some persistent ARP entries in there. Uh, change DHCP server to UTC or local time. Uh, enable in the graph. Dynamic DNS, MAC address controls. You can actually filter to deny certain MACs or ranges of MACs, which is kind of cool. NTP servers, which I have in here as well. TFTP servers, which I'm actually using because we have a TFTP server on the network. And network booting options. This is really clever. So with the network booting, I can specify the BIOS file name. It's fully UEFI compliant as well, which not all DHCP servers understand UF, UEFI. That's built in here. And this is actually part of a network boot system we have set up on our network. So that's the other thing I want to show you here. So we actually put this information in. We have the server, the file, the boot files, and this is all supported in PFSense's system. We can also go here to advanced. If you have a few other boot PDHCP options, those can be added in here as well. And down at the bottom, we have a few static reservations uh, for things. And let's talk about how those got added. So actually, you can go here to related settings. I'm sorry, go to status. And if I wanted to, here's our Amazon Echo happens to be at the top. I can add a wake on land mapping, or I can add a static mapping. And I just click this, brings me to the static page for this uh, particular device. Amazon Echo, I type in an IP address that's not in the range. I can override anything in particular about this, including what TFTP server it gets. So this is kind of clever, for example, if you want one network and you want, if your phones are all on the same network, you wanted them all to go have different TFTP servers for your phones versus some of the other devices, you can actually assign all that in detail to each one. Another kind of novel thing, if it senses the device has wake on LAN, that shows up here too. So things that have wake on LAN, I can actually send a wake on LAN packet to. And this adds a wake on LAN mapping. So we can actually do this, LAN, save. And this brings us over to the wake on LAN part, which we'll just jump to that right now. So DCP server, real extensible, very well done. Uh, one side note, and I'm going to jump here real quick about this. 192.168.303.0. 239. When you change the LAN IP range, you have to go in here. You'll get an error that you have to go back in and change it. So you change the LAN IP first, then change this. If you change this first, it'll tell you it's outside the subnet. So you actually have to change the IP address first, then you go into DHCP server and edit it. Uh, just a little side note there, but like I said, pretty, pretty straightforward. Wake on LAN. We'll just jump to this real quick. You can add wake on LAN mappings. You can wake all devices, add a list of devices here. It's kind of neat that they did this. You choose which interface you want to push that across. This one, because it's already a mapped one, already has in there. And you can just press that and it wakes up the device, edit the device, or go ahead and delete the device. Next on the services list, uh, DHCP, six relays, server RNA, both of those are in here. DNS forwarder is the old DNS server. It's still in here, but by default, it's not enabled. I don't know if they're going to remove it from future versions, but it's no longer the default. Everything's moved over to DNS resolver. DNS resolver is really nice. DNS sec support, a lot of options in here. We're going to go ahead and view it over here. So a lot of options in here. These are all the defaults. Uh, 
everything works perfectly fine as defaults. It also has an option, like I mentioned before, PFSense has a lot of these, a custom options box. These are where you can pass options uh, directly to the service from the command line, so to speak. So I want to add some option that it didn't have a checkbox for, you can do that. But the clever thing you can do is this here. So we're going to call this test. And let's say we wanted to do this, and this is a test server. Apply. Now what this has done is test.lawrencesystems.com will return to this IP address. This is really handy when you want things that have external mappings and you may not want to use that reflection on them, but you want to make sure they resolve internally. You can simply put them in here. So there's the host, there's that. You can also just do a domain override where you can take a domain, override it to a different IP address. Now this actually works as well for things like Facebook. If you put a domain like Facebook in here, and then redirected it to localhost, you could redirect it to somewhere else and when they're inside the network. So it's a real quick way to simply add mappings inside of here. We actually have a bunch of stuff internally mapped. Uh, so when we, because everything in our office is web-based, so this is an easy way for us to map all those web-based things that are internal, but still we want them to have host names attached to them. More customizations under the advanced resolver options you can get really fine grained detail in here, including some of the logging levels and things like that. You can also create access lists for who you want to access, allow, deny, uh, deny non-local, refuse non-local, more options here once again. So you maybe you only want a certain segment of the network to be able to ask, that's your internal DNS. That's definitely an option here for the firewall custom or for the DHCP server customizations. UPnP, completely supported. So if you have a device, and uh, this has come up a couple times where people can't get all the mappings to work right for things like an Xbox or a PlayStation because they support UPnP, you can turn that on and it allows all the different protocols of UPnP, NATPnP, NATPnP port mapping, what interface is going to be external and what internal interfaces. Now this is actually kind of cool because it does support, like we created the option VLAN, if you wanted to put your gaming systems on option VLAM and then only allow UPnP on the option VLAM or IoT devices in general that may use this, this is a great way to do it to keep your network secure. So you put everything on its own VLAN and then you can enable UPnP, not globally, but just for the uh, interfaces you want. And you can select multiple interfaces holding the control key in case you want it on a more than one interface. There's also some restrictions for traffic shaping, logging, uptime, um, specific entries that you can do for UPnP access control list, so you can really narrow down what's allowed to do this. Now this does have the option for a PPoE server. Never set one up, I don't have a lot of use case for it, but it's got all the options in here if that's something you wanted to do. NTP serving, if you wanted to have your own time server, this gets kind of weird because they didn't just put a time server in, they let you choose different pools, cool, you can add uh, more than one if you want. So we can add uh, this one here. And you just put another one in. So whatever the other ones are, you can put in each one. Uh, go from there, go from there, select or prefer it. So you can put a whole lot of different time servers in. That's neat, common. Access control list for your time servers, kind of cool. Serial GPS. This is weird that I, to me that they put this in here, but great that they did, I guess. It has a few different generic, uh, depending on the protocols used, and Garmin GPSs. You can plug a GPS in this and have it pull this for your timing. I don't have a good use case for it. Maybe someone does. Uh, I think maybe some ham radio operators might want to use this, where they're in a remote location and need some type of time sync with the firewall. I'm kind of not sure on that, but it's uh, kind of cool that it's, it's been in here for a while, and even in previous versions. Uh, IGMP proxying. That's an option in here. Load balancing. Now this is really cool. The load balance options, and I got a couple things set up in here for load balancing and SMTP. If we go here and edit this, what, this is not load balancing outbound traffic. This is load balancing inbound traffic. And let's say you have three mail servers because you have some incredible volume of mail coming in. You can actually take the servers on and off the list here and it can load balance the incoming to that server.
And it doesn't just support SMTP. We call it mail server. You choose the port. I mean, you could choose port 443 and have it load balance things in, uh, on the SSL port. You can have it uh, port 80 for standard HTTP. Uh, pretty neat. So it's definitely got load balancing options in here. I've not really used it much. Uh, it also lets you tie them together as a virtual server and then monitor how you want to monitor it, uh, the different options in here. It's not something I've really used much of, but it's definitely an option here. There's some documentation on their site, which of course, I think I pointed out before, you just click the little question mark, it'll bring you right to the documentation page for any of these options. So they have all the little details of how to set that up. Dynamic DNS is the last part we'll cover under services for now. You can, if you are, you know, have a changing IP, set up Dynamic DNS. So Dyn, D-Y-N DNS is a specific company that's very popular for this and they're supporting here. So is Hover and Namecheap and no IP, no IP free. Just open DNS, tons of companies zone at it. Cloudflare, custom. A lot of stuff in here is options, uh, which is kind of cool. So it changes the menus based on the different companies username, password, and we'll do it. And you can put more than one. So you can have multiple providers in here, which is really clever. It also has some specific options for things that are just RFC 2136, which is the dynamic DNS RFC 2136. We'll click here and it'll bring you to that page and get the details. The internet standards for tracking protocol. So it's got some standardized options in there for that. It also has check IP services. So I thought this is kind of cool. It's check IP that Dyn DNS Oregon. If you actually go there, tell your IP address. So you can actually add more services that do that. And it's a way to parse it and just get that information for your system. Moving on to VPNs. Now it supports IPsec. So here's all your standard IPsec settings. It has mobile client options, pre-shared keys, and some advanced settings for some of the details in here. Not an IPsec expert. It's been a long time since I set one of those firewalls up. It does have L2P in here. You can enable the L2P server, bind it to one of the interfaces, and configure that. It has its own user manager for the L2P server, which I think is kind of neat. Because OpenVPN, which we have set up here, it uses the internal database by default. Now you can use some of the other options. We're going to show you that here. Now here is the OpenVPN with one already set up to use the local database with remote user auth and some of the options. Now I've done an entire tutorial on how to set these up. And I really recommend when you want to set up, especially like a road warrior one, use the wizard. The wizard will start with the question of, are we doing a local user LDAP or radius? We're going to local, local user database. It'll have you create an authority. We don't need to add one. We'll just use the same one again next. WAN. Now we already have one 1194. So it's going to uh, give me an error if I choose this port or I could choose a different port to bind it to and it'll run you through all the default options and they're pretty much fine like I said I have a tutorial on the details on how to do this but when you're done you end up with OpenVPN being completely set up and ready to roll through the wizard now the one thing I added and over here in the package manager is this OpenVPN client export utility absolutely if you're going to use VPN you're going to want to load this and let me show you why so that puts and adds these menus here this is client export and we scroll down. And this is where it's really neat because the OpenVPN has a Windows installer that in line put everything I needed to authenticate that user except for their username and password in there. So I go and create a user in the user manager and then I go and install the VPN. They run it and away it goes. It installs VPN, they type in your username and password. Now, if you do the password a little bit differently and we use the, this is remote user but no SSL, we use remote user SSL. That means create a certificate per user. Now, even without, if it's just remote access user, you still have the other keys and certificates that are needed to connect. It's just not a per user certificate. So when we're over here doing it, it shows certificate name none. It's actually still has the cert for the system. Now, if you add certificates per user, each user will show up because you'll have to download each user and their certificate. And this, of course, supports the OpenVPN Connect for Android uh, inline client, which basically just means an inline file that has everything all contiguously in one file. That actually works straight for Linux. You can just go from the command line. If you download that file, type in OpenVPN space, the file name will sudo or make sure you're running as root, and it'll connect your Linux box to that. So OpenVPN is my favorite one to use in here. It works really, really well and has a lot of options. Now, 
because we have this VPN set up, it shows up under our firewall rules as OpenVPN. And by default, we have, and I called it OpenVPN Demo Wizard, the wizard creates the rules for you. There's a secondary way that you can add even more rules, like if you wanted the OpenVPN to also act as a gateway, when we're over here in the interface assignments, you can actually add it as a network interface. So OVPN S1 Demo VPN, it will add that as another interface so it can act as another interface to add rules to and against. And each server you add also can break out more rules that you can add against. In my demo video for this, I have, I kind of detail the use cases for that and when you have to do it and I walk you through a tutorial on that. So that's pretty much the whole uh, VPN setup. And then the user manager for it, of course, is just the standard user manager. Now the status menus are just a repeat of what was already the status as you could see for most things like, you know, this is the settings for the DHCP and then this is gonna be the related statuses or for the DHCP and it's all in here. So we have your DHCP leases, your filter reload, the gateway statuses, interfaces, Everything that you've seen mostly as we've been going through this, we click on a status page, you can see is right here. This is just a different way to get to it versus clicking up at the top right here. A couple of things that aren't in here though is like the services page. Now, this is the same like we have on the dashboard. We have the services, but we go to status, services. You get a few more options just to restart the service, jump to the settings for that service, related status, and related log entry. So it's kind of a quick way to say, okay, these are all services that are running. I want to jump to the options. So if I want to jump to the options page for the DNS resolver, that takes me right there. And this is the log entries for the DNS resolver. So it's a quicker way to do that. So that's on the status. Traffic graphs, this is not, a, this is kind of an expanded view like you've seen here on the dashboard. We have the traffic graphs. Let's me choose the little more details of things I want to see, your WAN, local remote, where things are going to, sort by tree address, host name, fully qualified domain name. So as I access things that go through the network, I can kind of filter and see in real time what's going through here. The other thing in a status is the system logs. They're actually under status, not diagnostics. Kind of thought that was a little strange, but it's really put them. And this gives you all the logging options so you can detail and go through them. You always notice you have the plus here and this allows you to use regular expressions to filter anything that's in there. Filter by time, process, PID, whatever you need to do on the firewall to take a look at that. Now, while you're here and we start at system, we go to settings. You can change this over here and increase in the log file size. And I usually check this box here, which is shows log entries in reverse order at the top. I like them at the top, but you also have some more options in here if you want to display as a second row, column, how you want the logs displayed, reset the logs, and the option to send everything to a remote logging server. So I hit save. Whoop. Make the size even bigger. I had the wrong number in there. Changes have been applied, and now the log files, it tells you how about the approximate size of the log file here. Uh, display currently used is 579 k of 149 gig, which is how much is on here for extra storage. So now when I go to the rules, here's all the things in there, and that's displaying the latest one at the top. I just think that's better. Also has a summary view for the firewall, which is kind of neat. So it'll tell you uh, interfaces, information about those interfaces, data points, the IPs it's traversing through it, kind of a quick summary page of the firewalls. The dynamic view uh, has an auto update updates. I think it's every 10 or 20 seconds it'll refresh and put the latest entries in here. But everything in here has different options. So like your open VPN rules when you're looking for something you can find it, use regular expression to find a specific thing. This is really handy for troubleshooting because you go through here and you just follow all the uh, messages in there. And it's nice too, because right here on OpenVPN, now we're at the OpenVPN. So you can jump right between the log and the settings or even the status pages between there to make sure the service is running. 
really, I like the way PFSense does this right here because now I can just change the setting, log the setting, is there an error without having to jump through any of the menus and it keeps me all related to what I'm looking at. So I can get, okay, I need to check this and do that. It's kind of a nice design and layout of the firewall. Last thing we're gonna cover is the diagnostics pages. We have an ARP table, so we can look up all the th ARPing going on, delete entries, things like that. Authentication testing. This is clever. You have local database options. So if I wanna know if a password works, and it does, let's try, what about this guy? Authentication failed, kind of novel. Backup restore is awesome on this. So all we gotta do to back this firewall up, we're gonna save the entire config file. Hit save, now we've downloaded the config file for it. By default, it wants to back up everything, but I can just back up a specific thing. So if I know all the aliases we created are relevant to another firewall, I can say, just give me the alias file. Just give me the settings for DNS resolver, so on and so forth. Just give me the settings for OpenVPN, and it will do that, including the, the CA information will get tied in there as well. I always, when I'm doing backups, I do an all backup. Restore, much more fine grain. So if you have a backup from another firewall and you wanna push it to another firewall, you can only restore what you want, like static routing tables or the aliases, for example. So I always do a backup of all, but when I'm doing a restore, sometimes I wanna do a selective restore. You just do that, it reboots it, and away you go. You can encrypt the file, probably not a bad idea to keep it password protected, especially if your VPN's in there because if someone has your config file, they can extract your VPN credentials and logins out of it. And if the file's encrypted, it has the password option here, and same thing, you put the password here to create the file, and there uh, also has an option at the bottom just to reinstall the packages. This gets a step further of cool when you go here to Captive Portal. Now, this little plus here, by default, it's keeping 30 backups, but you can override that and change it. it. tells you how much backup space is being used. This is where it gets neat, is because you can differential these. So uh, change change system logging options, configuration change for your PFSense, diff. If it's an XML file, it will do the diff of what changed. It also tracks who did the changes, uh, whether it was a system or if it was a admin, whoever changed the rule, options are all in here. So let's do a diff between like these two, see more rule changes, diff, and it highlights the changes between the two versions. Now, the cool thing too is these logs, I'm gonna bring back this over here, and we're gonna go to restore configuration, list backups, and they're all listed here on the console as well. So I can read and say, I have uh, one, two, three, four. I can just type in the uh, restore backup on there and restore to a previous configuration right from here. It'll restart the firewall and have that configuration back in place. So it works both ways from the command line. And if you do something to lock yourself out, easy enough to go back in there and do it. Going back down the list here, command prompt. You can grab a file. So conf.config.xml is the location of that config.xml file, download. I can pull the file right out of here. If you know where a file is, you can just type in that, hit download. If you want to upload a file, you can do that. And uh, you can do this too. It'll execute PHP commands. It will do commands in a shell. So PWD, it works out of uh, user local www. Uh, you can actually do an ls in, in here too. It'll dump this right to the screen. So you can execute commands without actually logging in. DNS lookup. You can just do this real quick and look up uh, anything you want. Kind of clever. So there's the Google's mail server. Here's the I name servers it used. Here's the results from that and the records related to it. Uh, you can right from here quickly build an alias on that record. This is really handy when we log into clients when they're saying they're having a problem on their network. We can use this to quickly look up to see how it looks from their network. Factory reset, edit file. Uh, edit file is kind of like it sounds. It actually lets you edit a file. So if we went conf slash config XML load, we can load that file in here, edit and save it. Uh, if you want to edit anything in a firewall manually, you know the location of it. It does have a browse option. So you can pull certain files and edit them. 
Factory defaults is like it sounds. It'll reset the system to factory defaults. It is a two-step process, so uh, you can click it, but you then got to go another step further here. Halt system, kind of like it sounds, turns it off. Limiter info. That is if you have any of the limiters set it up under the queues for the traffic shaping, it will give you the details on there. NPD tables. Packet capture. This is pretty cool. You can grab a certain interface and uh, turn it on for promiscuous mode. It has some in, uh, limitations on that. I've added one of the cards that parts it. But you can grab all the data, a certain count, level of detail, full. Got to have a fast enough machine to be able to do this. Do reverse DNS, look up on IPs, how many counts of packets, packet lengths, or port, or a specific host address, specific protocol, or IPv4 only, for example. And then you can do a full packet dump and then download the file out of the system. PF info, this automatically refreshes uh, here. So you have some nice network statistics on here. PF top, so you can see some of the connections, sort by age, sort by uh, expiration or packet. Reboot, well, that's pretty obvious. Routes, show your routing tables. This is really handy when you're trying to sort things out and make sure the routing teams are there without having to drop to the command line. And you can see, you know, all the different options when you're going, okay, these are all the route tables. These are everything in here. When you're troubleshooting VPNs, this is your best friend. Smart status. I'm going to jump over to my firewall for this. I only have one hard drive in my firewall. Didn't feel the need to make it redundant. But I can actually go here, go to all, hit view, and it dumps the entire smart status of my hard drive and all of the details in here. It also has a, a self-test logs. Uh, you can perform a self-test on there, the different options that are related to smart and which hard drive you want to test. Sockets, these are the all socket connections on the firewall directly. States, you can see every individual state and connection and forcibly delete them. Now, of course, these are just standard state tables. They'll reestablish, but at least you can see what states are there and search for them finding something when you're tracing something out, this is really handy. System activity, essentially like top, and it's real time updated. This is kind of neat. These are some of the database tables that are in here. So we added these ones, like we added NVR recorder and a few others that end up in here. So uh, these are the NAT subnets that were added. Kind of weird that it's in here, but kind of novel at the same time. Bogon networks. They're essentially database tables inside the system. Now, test port, I like this a lot. So if we go here and we know that's Google's mail server and we put in port 25 and we hit test and it's successfully connected to Google's mail server, port 25, and down here is the results from that. Now, this is kind of cool because it lets you choose the different options and source addresses. So you can actually come from whichever address you have available, IPv4, IPv6, and do some port testing. Now, this works for internal devices as well as external devices. And then we have trace route. So we can do a source address, WAN, LAN, uh, whichever one we want to go on there. Whether or not we want to do reverse lookups. And hit trace route, and it'll do a trace route and dump it to the screen. And it looks like it didn't make it all the way to the destination, but it made it a few hops out and dumped some details on here. But it's not a built-in function on there. So that's pretty much it for the PF Sense. I will cover one last thing here that I added a package to show you because these are ways the packaging works in a little bit more detail. So we added IF Top, and you may not have seen IF Top in any of these lists, but I added it. Some of them, you, this is where you have to look up each package itself, will do different things. Like IFTOP, for example, is a command line package. So it runs here. The OpenVPN client export tool shows up under OpenVPN. So let's go back to Package Manager. And look for another one. Let's look at Darkstat and install this. Confirm. Package is installed. Darkstat shows up over here. So here's the Darkstat settings. We click to enable. We're going to use this as the capture and web interface. Save and access it. It's added the interface, 
locally, put it here. Here's some of the hosts. It started collecting data right away. So this is the one thing maybe a little bit confusing about PFSense is whenever you add a third-party package, there's not a consistent place third-party add-ons go. So you have to look up the packages you're doing. And when you want to add them in here, you want to uh, see where they're going. While I was doing this, there's a new version of PFSense. So let's go ahead and show you how the update works on this. We're going to go ahead and get it, confirm. And this is all there is to updating it. It's really fast. It doesn't take long. It's downloading the files. This is normal. It kind of swings back and forth while it's doing the updates. It says update complete rebooting. So I drag this over here. Update is complete rebooting. So you're getting this broadcast message on here because we had IF top open. And it does take a second. Now we have a countdown here and it's going to count down how long it's going to take to reboot. It's already in a reboot mode over here. Now when it reboots from an update, occasionally it'll pause and extract some extra files that it added. Uh, that varies from update to update of how long that may take if there's really much to it. It'll also update the packages. There'll be a message someone up here that it's doing that. Yep, here's the extraction part for the files that we downloaded. Well, it downloaded automatically. And that's it. Update's done, configuring WAN interface. It'll be back up and running here in just a second. And it's back up and running. That quick for an update. It's really not a big deal. And just in time, because this says 7654321, dialed, 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 out of patience. And now the system's on the latest version. Updates are pretty pain-free in here. I've uh, never really had a problem. We don't mind even doing them remotely. They've, uh, even with some of the different hardware, not necessarily all hardware that's from the NetGate, we've not had a problem with. It's really a flexible system. The nice thing is too, you can restore an older backup file. So if we have a machine that does brick upon update, we replace it and just push their backup file and everything's back to normal like nothing ever happened. Not been much of a problem. But uh, that was it for PFSense. It's a good overview of all the systems in here. Uh, like I said, I have some separate videos on some specific things. A lot of people like to talk about Sericata. I did a specific video on the Sericata system that's uh, available too. Uh, check the links and I have an entire playlist just for all my firewall tutorial videos. So hopefully those are helpful. If there's something I missed or something I should make a more specific video about, let me know if you like the content here. Like and subscribe. Thank you very much.